Hi, I'm Robin. I design type for the Tiny Type Co. and I'm a senior designer at Scandinavian Design Group in Oslo, Norway. I want to talk a little bit about using historic material in type design. I've been thinking a lot about what it means to make revivals, how much it influences our view of type, and what lessons we can learn from historic material that ultimately have greater value than specific designs. To be very, very brief and give away the whole talk, I'm looking at hero worship and craft as craft. I'm questioning historic survivor bias and I'm looking into alternatives. A curious person takes things apart to see what makes them click. There are lots of things that we use every day that we are completely used to, that we just accept. We don't challenge or explore what those things are, how they work or how they work that way. You can take apart alarm clocks, songs, or even chairs. You might not always be able to put them back together, but you'll often learn a lot. What I want to take apart is the way we use historic materials. Revivals are an institution in type design. We make copies of older designs for new media and explore what the original shapes really were like. We also use this historic material as reference for quality and as a baseline for certain rules. Some of these rules have slowly developed and merged fully into our craft. Rhythm, proportion, consistency, influence of our tools on our work, appropriateness of the medium. Gerrit Nord says the stroke provides a theory of type design that is entirely founded on the tools used to produce calligraphy and type. That model abstracts away individual actors and focuses on the methods and history of the forms to the point that the evolution of our letter forms is only logical when you understand how they were created. Frank Blocklump's research into formalized unitized type design is equally based on the craft, rather than on a specific example that fits the model. He finds logic in the actual production of the metal type, rather than only in the more abstract design process. The production is the design. And this goes way back. He finds these examples of unified widths in 1472, and this in its own way brings a deeper understanding to the history of the craft. But we also have the things we call revivals, and what they are burdened with is baggage, the particulars of the originals, the consistent bias that history shows for certain people and certain work, and hero worship. There are several problems to discuss. The particulars of the specific designs can distract from the design principles. When we call Garamond an old style or Renaissance typeface, there are certain expectations in the category language. Formally, we expect a relatively low stroke contrast, a contrast angle of about 30 degrees, bracketed serifs, and capitals with varying widths. When we, however, ask for a Garamond or Garald, as the category is also known, we're introducing a lot of complications. The works by his contemporaries, people like Guillaume Lebey, Pierre Hautin, and Robert Grandjean, were of the same category language, and they definitely knew each other. They worked in the same field, on the same kind of products. To view Garamond's work in isolation would not educate a type designer to be. Another known problem is that there is no authoritative single reference Garamond typeface. For example, every design was made to a specific size. That's the nature of lead type. And in our eagerness to brand things with familiar names, a lot of type became called Garamond, including work by Jean Genon, 60 years after Claude Garamond had died, which almost comically does not look like Garamond's work, but which definitely became a Garamond in the eyes of typographers around the world. Even when we have a single reference design, it can be hard to say what really makes it what it is. The category was named after Garamond, but the contents within it are, very rarely, a singular Garamond. The difference has become too great for it to bear the one name. Which leads us to the following conflict. The implicit survivor bias in the telling of history is damaging to the actual history of the craft. Although we've largely corrected our historic records on who designed what, we did for centuries refer to Jeannon's work as Garamond, to Grand Jean's italics as Garamond. The simplified version of history removes all the typefaces that didn't make it for whatever reason. Garamond worked during an incredibly busy period in type history, and we have to assume a lot of that history is lost. Lost for whatever reason. We simply can't know. Lost perhaps because of an unfortunate bankruptcy, a bad reputation with the local powers, or simply used 
in books nobody deemed worth keeping. There is a risk of believing that only type that made it all the way to the here and now was the only type worth keeping, and that presumes a meritocracy that simply doesn't exist. Finally, hero worship creates a dramatically skewed image of type design history, where only a handful of individuals decided on the course of the craft. Claude Garamond didn't work alone in his foundry. No foundry where hot type alloy was melted was operated by the one designer, punch cutter, matrix justifier, floor sweeper, lunch chef, and also a salesman. It asks for too much to believe that he worked alone. But as a consequence of his celebrity, what we primarily have is the idea that Garamond was a singular visionary who was the sole cause of the success of his work. Hero worship also leads to unquestioning belief. This is, of course, an exaggerated example, and I don't know any type designers who say this. But the idea that the name Caslin has become so strong and so singular is not based on merit, but on celebrity. The various incarnations of the Caslin type foundries have had many, many type choices available for typographers, varying in purpose and quality. And a blanket statement like this ignores that complexity. So what did I learn from using historic sources? For my own foundry, I currently only have historic references for sale. There's a direct interpretation of some designs by Piet Zwart from the 1930s, and there's a broader interpretation or translation of Haas Kaslom, paired with a sans serif that references the same era. And in these projects, I learned a lot of things about the historic material I was interpreting. This may be the moment you think, hey, isn't she being a huge hypocrite? And maybe, maybe I am a hypocrite for being critical of revivals while having basically made a few. But I also believe that I got to this place of critique because of the revivals I made. There is a great value in revivals, the ones where you expose a design to a new medium, and the ones where you have to learn the internal language of the design. Monumental Grotesque does things that Piet Zwart never planned or even imagined, such as the extended language support, and designing those entirely new shapes required a lot of puzzling and resolving to understand the real idea behind the design. In my eyes, the craft of type design is industrial design more than graphic design, furniture making more than poster design. A chair, if we reduce it to its simplest purpose, only needs to keep our butt up. But we judge a chair for a lot more. The quality with which one's butt is kept up, the quality in which the chair fits the space it is placed in, the curves in the woodwork, the fabrics and the armrests. And that sort of work, the craft of the furniture maker, ultimately is not predicated on having to look like other chairs in order to be a valid chair. There are certainly platonic ideals to some extent that we seek to realize. Category language is an amalgamation of more than just one piece of work, but rather the entire environment in which individual pieces can exist. A chaise long will meaningfully differ from a dining chair. Perhaps your chair does end up looking a lot like this. I don't know. It holds the butt up. But we can judge it for the craft you invested into it and for the quality of the sitting, and we never need to compare it to other chairs. Similarly, in type design, a high contrast serif typeface with a vertical axis and pointed pen contrast has its own category language. But just as we don't need to compare every chaise long to the LC4, designed by Le Corbusier, Pierre Jeanneret, and Charlotte Perrion, we don't need to compare every high contrast serif with a category language from the 18th century only to Fernandi Do's works. To limit yourself to a revival may even give a false sense of security. So long as I copy this surviving design, surely I am also copying its virtues. But that presumes a lot about the original and teaches you nothing about the reason the design looked and worked like that in the first place. Another thing I've become concerned with is the language we use. We call our projects revivals, bringing designs back to life. It's a funny choice of word, an implication, for example, that the original has died, that you are the Dr. Frankenstein who will somehow inject life into it. There is a strange claim to greatness in that. A greatness by association, maybe? Or was it on its last breath? Did we rescue a design that was dying by redrawing it? Did that save the life of the font? When a chair design is revived, people don't call it that. In furniture, if you're getting an Eames desk chair, the expensive type, 
but at a really low price, what you're buying is a copy. Not a homage or a revival, not a remix or a reinterpretation. And if you pretend that you came up with it, we call that a ripoff. There is honour in a cover band not pretending to be Led Zeppelin and Queen and the White Stripes. What often happens, and this is a much more related framework in my opinion, is that an idea gets translated. It gets translated from one time, place, format, ideology, technology to another. And that, by definition, changes the thing. That's the secret behind every translation. When you read a translation of a text, you now read the words of two writers. Every translation tries to make the original relevant to a new audience in its own way, with its own agenda and its own needs. A lot of type education already largely works this way. It already centers the craft, and they can judge a log like a chair. What I'm proposing is that we finally let go of our heroes. We learn more from the environments they worked in, their influences, their collaborations, and the many advancements to the craft that have come since their time than from their individual type designs. And that is ultimately the spirit of standing on the shoulders of giants, not pretending to be that giant or to copy it, but to embrace its role in your growth. A way I'm exploring this myself is in the form of remixes and other experiments. One such example is a bridge I tried to build between 1450 and 1950, a jump across time and type styles. When we learn about historic type, we can see certain ideas that maybe got lost to time. The upright capitals next to the cursive lowercase in this Renaissance italic, very much in the tradition of Francesco Griffo, if not in his work, which I'm not sure of, are a very interesting peculiarity. Over time they disappeared, and the capitals became italicized with the rest. But the appeal to me of a nice, tightly spaced lowercase, combined with these proud white capitals, felt like a wonderful, pure idea that if I understood it correctly, did not have to remain in the Renaissance. If we were to combine those shapes with a different era of forms altogether, maybe, say, a quite rationalized grotesque from the mid-20th century, that should, in theory, still work. Rhythm, proportion, spacing, as long as those things are in place, a lot of doors close, sure, but some open up. And I'm willing to say that it actually works. It's fun. This is an outtake from the upcoming Tiny Grotesque. The final family ended up finding a different path, a better way to tell its own story. But the whole thing started with historic inspiration. Speaking of hero worship, Francesco Griffo, he killed his own son-in-law. Just a fun little nugget I thought I'd throw in there for you. Another example is the sort of synthesis that happens in a creative process when you try to pay homage when you try to speak a specific category language without imitating any particular exponent of that category language. For example, this is Gagneur, a very poorly researched attempt at drawing a French Renaissance typeface from memory. I've referred to some drawings here and there when in doubt, but ultimately, it looks like none of the sources I've gathered. Sometimes complicating my job, but also, more often than not, opening up new possibilities. Of course, there is a lot of unconscious work in this, a lot of inspiration I have absorbed over the years. But that isn't invalidating. I think it is in fact quite exciting that something I drew from a gut feeling can feel so fitting to the category language. But maybe the right word for this isn't a remix, a homage, or an interpretation. Maybe this is a pastiche. Let me know down in the comments. When I take apart a typeface, I can learn a lot. I look at what it is and what it does. And I look less at who it quotes. I see English transitional forms, I see Dutch crispness, and I see the new ideas that I felt necessary to make the design mine. When I look at the official source for Dover Serif text, I can still easily see where I started. But I think I took it somewhere else. I translated Edmund Thielis, Haas Kaslam, itself an interpretation of historical work. It carries on a lot of tradition from the original Kaslam, but it has its own charm. Adobe Castle feels appropriately of the same age. A facsimile or copy or digital version might be a better word for what this is. It leaves a very similar impression. The capital to lowercase proportion is also maintained, and it feels a bit poetic, perhaps. So when I go back to my reference, and I see what I took from the sources, 
I can sometimes lose that connection. I see so many places where I inserted myself, my needs, my expectations of what the Caslam category could do today. I made a lot of corners much more acute. I made the lowercase taller relative to the capitals. I trimmed the length of the ascenders and descenders. It makes the face a little bit more matter of fact, a little less poetic. If those are the right words to describe what is ultimately my translation of someone else's translation. Before I wrap this up, I want to thank Indra, Amy, Sahar, Bianca, and Tanya, who made me do this and then helped me do it. I also want to thank Anna, who's hiding behind the camera. Thank you, Anna. You can also find me online at tinytype.co, or you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for your attention.